Hello there. So, as you might be able to tell for one, I've found out that you can use your phone camera instead of just your bad webcam, so I'm a little bit more HD, and I, I'm not sure that's a good thing, but here I am. Uh, secondly, hello. How are you all doing? I tried to give a better background this time too, but uh, for those you can see, because I know a lot of people just listen, it's still kind of my white void, because it turns out that the only lighting situation in this poorly lit room is the white void of the curtains. So hey, um, first of all, let me make an intro. Uh, so certain words of mine that I will have to use to describe the following book won't be in the first couple minutes and YouTube won't, you know, get angry at me for that because we're going to be saying a lot of um, certain words. But today we're going to be talking about Sweet Evil, the Sweet Evil trilogy. Uh, when I do these sorts of books, I always say I don't really make book reviews for people who are actually reading the books. If you do read the books, I love to see it. I want to hear about people's experience with these really bad books. Um, or if you pick it up because I talked about it and like your thoughts versus my thoughts on it, that's very fun. But please never feel like these are reviews that are written for people who have read the same book because in most cases, I really don't want you to read any of these sorts of things. And this is a obscure-ish, but it's probably, it's more well-known than Perfected, because Perfected was a mainstream accessible kind of book, but uh, this is Sweet Evil, which was a much better seller overall, much more mainstream paranormal romance from 2012 to 2015. It's a trilogy that has its own novella. It's called Sweet Evil by Wendy Higgins, and it's one of my favorite bad book series. Um, it's one of the many like YA of the time, which basically took bold and ridiculous decisions. Just so many strange choices that they just did back then. I, I don't know what was going on in like 2012 in the publishing scene to let this sort of thing happen, as you will see. And so many of the decisions and <laughs> everything that happens in Sweet Evil, a lot like Halo as well, they're so ridiculous that you just like laugh, but you're also shocked because there's often some sort of really insanely offensive thing in it. Oh, okay, so I'm just very excited. I'm gonna give, of course, the, as usual, the full plot summary. I'm gonna spoil all the weird bits, try and analyze whatever the hell's going on. You know, lots of people do commentary on TV and movies on YouTube, um, but books are just as ripe for having fun with. They're just not that visually exciting. Which is a shame, because there's some insane books out there that you can talk about just like you'd talk about a bad movie. But, you know, a book is so much more of a time commitment, and I'm, I'm hoping to close that market in there, because the amount of insane YA books that people have never heard of, or, you know, don't read YA so don't realize that this happened, and this is real, and thousands and thousands of people read these books, bought these books, they're out there. It's a real series, all of them, and they're out there all the time, so... Sweet Evil. Sweet Evil is a story about a girl who's half angel and... Okay, actually, I have a very fun, spicy thing to do, which is, did you know that YA books often used to have book trailers? Very few people know about this. It's strange to me. So yeah, to combat the fact that books are hard to make visually engaging, there was this whole trend, um, again around like 2013, for putting together trailers with like voice acting and usually stock footage of a model, maybe they would hire somebody. They were all extremely funny and maybe I'll do a video on it sometime because they're both they spent some money on it, but obviously they were kind of testing the waters of maybe book trailers will go big in some way. You know, maybe this is a good market. They don't know. But a lot of publishers tried them at the time. And a lot of them are just on YouTube to find. You can kind of wind up on a rabbit hole if you check out some publishers like Harper Teen, for example, who published Sweet Evil. And um, I'd like to play the Sweet Evil trailer now because it's one of my favorite things. The first line always kills me. Okay. <laughs> My name is Anna, and I used to be a good girl. You see, I'm the daughter of a guardian angel and a fallen one. So that helps, right? Right? <laughs> let, let, let's just get into it, okay? Sweet Evil. Mm, there's a lot to say about Sweet Evil. The increasingly and incredibly Christian themes, because we're doing another angel book here. The insane hypo, like... <sighs> hypocritical, hypocritical, that's how you pronounce that word, nature of just the sheer horniness in this story, the sexism, the, the premise, whatever's going on of Copano, um, 
Caden's participation. That's the love interest in Crimes Against Humanity. Some, I mean, unlike Halo, which was already just bordering on some disagreeable ideas in regards to how it did its Christian themes, this is a book that will take that a step much further in ways that I, I'm very excited to talk about. Yeah, I mean, you might think that Sweet Evil, okay, generic paranormal romance about a good girl falling for a bad boy, and they're both kind of half-fallen angels, and you'd be right if you think that's what it is. And then the next 60% of book one happens, because the pacing and the story is off the rails. I mean, there are no rails on the coaster of Sweet Evil, the trilogy, and I'm, l let me be your conductor. <laughs> Sweet Evil is this book that I would saw a lot over the years and I never picked it up for a very long time. It was vaguely familiar, but it sounded just super uninteresting, even from a I love bad books point of view, because I'm not interested in every bad book. Some of them I don't want to pick up, you know? The back is sort of like, what if some teens literally had to be bad influences to survive? But it neglects to mention the fact that it's because they're all children of the Dukes of Hell who force them to inspire and emulate sins as part of this ongoing war for souls and against heaven. I read angel and demon books without hesitation, uh, but even just knowing that is way better than some like vague cursed to be bad influences thing. But yeah, this is angels and demons, uh, really angels all along because the demons are just fallen angels specifically. So of course I had to get it. Anna, um, yeah, it's Anna. I'm about to say Anna because I know people usually say Anna. Uh, Aunt Anna is our first person narrator who of course begins ignorant of her true nature. She does however know she has special powers, a lot of them. She can see emotions as auras. She can will herself to feel the emotions of other people, like hyper empathy at will. She has super senses. She cannot get ill or catch any disease. If she drinks, takes drugs, you know, it all wears off extremely quickly. She can see guardian angels and demonic spirits. And she later develops the ability to psychically will people to follow her orders. So basically, Anna is really OP for someone who doesn't do jack shit the entire book. Since... I mean, all but the commanding other people are also traits of all the Nephil, the Nephilim. And her love interest thus has pretty much all the same power she does and generally takes care of problems. Like many paranormal romance, angel, demon, YA, whatever, book protagonists, she, she's very passive. She doesn't do anything, even though she's super OP and so is everybody else. So Anna runs into Caden at a party and is just instantly overcome with horniness, like just really oozing with it. I mean, they have this weird link since being a Nephilim, he can tell that she is one too, but he can also tell that she is special. You see, Anna's dad was a fallen angel, but her mom was a non-fallen angel. This marks her as pure and more special and such. You know the deal. She's the protagonist. There's only a few hundred Neph, they're usually called Neph for short, in the world, and 13 Dukes, who are demons who live on Earth in human bodies and sway humans to sin. The Neph are basically property of their fathers and used to influence humanity, and they all serve their fathers with 100% devotion, because they're basically like raised by their demon or fallen angel dads to go be bad people. So they're all very devoted to them. Each duke has a specialty sin. Yes, there are 13 of them, and it, it I knock something very loudly, apologies. Yeah, there's 13 dukes, so it's more than just the seven deadly sins. But I don't actually think we have a full list of any of them. So Caden, though, is the son of lust, and thus he struggles to contain his lusty impulses. Yeah, so you not only do you have the responsibility of fulfilling like what your dad does, so his dad is the lust one, so he has to work for his dad by doing lust related activities, we'll get there. We also have that you inherit like a strong inclination to it, so he struggles with being extremely horny. Anna's dad is the Duke of Substance Abuse. <laughs> Which, okay, so she has this strong pull to drink and do drugs that she constantly feels like lured into, even though she's pretty immune to them. So she actually gets off quite easily because even if she does give in and like do a bunch of drugs, they wear off in like 10, 20 minutes max, like anything. Unlike Caden, who's just super horny all the time. 
So Caden bumps into Anna at this party and he basically explains all the rules and the world to Anna like fairly early on, which is good because in a lot of YA books of this sort and YA paranormal, it's famous for introducing the fact that the love interest is paranormal in some way, like halfway through to nearly at the end. Like Twilight, I think it's maybe around halfway through. I, I never actually read Twilight, I'm not that interested. And uh, say the Fallen series, that takes place I think that one's legitimately in like the last hundred pages that there's any sort of reveal. So this one's actually pretty early on, which is good. I mean, this is a long book for what it is. It's over 450 pages. So it's it's over pretty fast. Caden finds himself interested in Anna, especially because she resists his advances. And his whole thing is that he's so hot and so sexy, no woman has ever turned him down before. Her dad, like Anna's dad, has been in jail her whole life, and he volunteers to drive her across the country to go meet him, as well as meet this nun who dies before they get there and later leaves Anna a sword in her will. And that's mostly in book two, but there's, there's a dead nun situation as well. But yes, Anna was raised by uh, adopted mother, and that is it. So she has had no influence of her demonic dad, and she is interested in meeting him because he's in jail which is, you might think is a bit odd for a demon, but yeah, he's just been hanging out in jail her entire life. So the first part of this book is a road trip. I like, actually, I thought like this is wrong at first, but actually it's just three days of them driving to cross the majority of the country, which I think is technically possible on driving across the USA, but like they're, they're booking it right through because this takes place in Georgia. So they, they're just on a road trip for the first part of the book. Anna going in is super attracted to and into Caden, and he's doing the typical, like, don't fall for me, I don't do relationships kind of thing, you know. He is interested in boning her, and, you know, after two nights of hanging out with him, she's wanting to bone him too. However, she's a Christian, and she wants to wait until marriage, or at least in a deeply committed relationship, so they don't actually have sex. There's a lot of physical stuff and sexuality in this book, despite the lack of sex. Like, everybody's just really horny all the time. Uh, Caden, more than once, more than once Caden has to do this, has to, like, pace frantically or take a cold shower because he's so amped up. Like, yeah. So they, they road trip. Anna meets her dad, who is, you know, for a fallen angel, he's cheesy nice, but he's been redeemed and he's a Christian now, despite being, you know, a Duke of Hell. So he's become Christian and is just in jail so that he can basically hide from the other Dukes to hide the fact that he's become basically redeemed. And also Anna falls deeply in love with Caden because uh, like the third night of them traveling together, she asks him to have sex with her and he refused at the last moment. Like he's super tempted and then he's like, no, I will not have sex with you. And yeah, so she falls instantly in true love with him because of that. Yeah, so I mean, that feels like a lot of substance for the book, but actually it's less than the first half or so. The pacing is extremely even. And like the fact that they finished this road trip, that feels like the end of a lot of books like this, but instead it's about halfway. This book takes place over nine months. So... Caden is extremely hot cold after all of this, like despite not living very close to Anna, like they return home, he somehow keeps bumping into her at parties and Anna meets four other Nephilim kids. There's the twins, Blake and Copano, who kind of latch onto her and become her friends. Her dad returns free from jail and he starts training her in <laughs> resisting alcohol by basically making her drink an insane amount of booze to like learn her limits and train her to pretend to do demon work so that the other dukes don't realize that he's been reformed and like is a good person now. Which is kind of funny because it is like, um, I'm going to, tra I, he trains his daughter on getting extremely blasted and drunk. And um, I swear to God, he trains her on some drugs as well, but it's it's for good, it, it's, it's actually for good. There's more tension, I mean, as Caden basically is hot and cold, he's like, you know, oh, I'll never see you again, you know, we can't be together, but also they can't resist each other, you know, whatever. After a while, there's this party where all of the Dukes of Hell, um, you know, get together. This is on New Year's, so they, um, Anna has to, like, pretend to work, you know, by basically influencing other teens to go and drink a lot of alcohol and take drugs, whatever. Then all of the Nephilim and Dukes all meet together and they force this woman to eat poisoned food. 
for some reason, they're just sort of like, hey, we're having our annual New Year's meeting. Uh, get this random woman to eat poison food. Anna freaks out watching this woman, like, die of poisoning. So some angels descend from above and um, basically are like, problem solved. And then the book ends. I mean, that that's the full plot removing some certain things that I'm going to get into as a... Um, this is one of those reviews that I wrote a while ago. So unlike like the Perfected or Light Lark one, which had a lot of quotes, I didn't used to take as many quotes in there and the format's a bit different. So rather than a really, really long summary, I instead go into subsections where I'll tell you more of book one plot as we go. Does YouTube let you say the word horniness? I said it a lot in the Light Lark video and that's still allowed to exist. So horniness is what this subject is, but mostly the hypocritical horniness that this book has. So as mentioned, this book like oozes sexuality. Uh, not, I guess, in the fun way people usually mean when they say that. It, the book is more like damp and gross from it. Anna is horny for Caden all of the time, and Caden is literally cursed to be uncontrollably down to clown. There's also quite a lot of mentions of background people like making out, going topless, wearing revealing clothes, being full of lust. Like, sex is a big deal in this book, and it's pretty much everywhere. And this is really kind of ironic when you consider how Christian the book is. Like, I, I haven't covered that section yet in full, but Anna is this sort of virtuous, perfect heroine. Uh, she's a virgin, and that's not like a small detail. It's kind of a plot point. Like, the entire series, her virginity is important. Multiple characters, Neff and bad influence teens, mock her for being a virgin. Her female best friend mourns being a virgin, specifically. Caden's moment of truth, literally called a self-sacrifice, is when he pulls back from taking Anna's virginity. It's the moment she falls in love with him, and probably vice versa. One duke can smell her virginity, We'll go into that more, and it's important she not go near him and thus reveal that she's still pure. Even though, like, this would expose, like, Caden, who lies about taking her virginity, and, like, it would expose her dad for, you know, being actually reformed and good and, like, letting her be this pure person, she manages to just keep her virginity the whole time, even though it would be detrimental. I mean... Okay, literally, literally, I'm going to get into it so much later, but like in book three, her virginity gets one of her friends killed. So it, it's this very strange thing. And it's because it's not just Christian books that do this. YA in general has a real virginity obsession, you'll find. When you have any sort of book that deals with a darker subject, the virginity of the character, the main character always keeps their virginity. And this was in Perfected, and it's also in a series called uh, Fever, the Chemical Garden series, which I read book one of, and you'll see it in a lot of other things like this, where if the book deals with some darker subjects, like for example in Perfected, where Ella is kept as a human pet, you know, which is commonly exploited, but she manages to avoid going to have to work in the black market, she avoids any sort of assault or anything like that, she keeps her virginity until she loses it, you know, in a loving way with her, you know, significant other, which is good for her. But you'll see that that always happens in YA books like this, uh, as opposed to the best friend or anything like that. So you can compare her to, say, Missy, who apparently a lot of people cried for in my review of Perfected. And you'll see that there's always a secondary character or even the love interest can have sex or will have had sex, but will in some way maybe suffer for it or, you know, be harmed by it while the main character is able to just skirt any sort of the dark subject matter that would potentially make them not a virgin anymore. Instead, they remain a virgin throughout the whole book. And it's one of those really troubling tropes that's just sort of about elevating the importance of virginity in society, which is this really harmful kind of myth that we have. Because, as again, it's nothing wrong at all uh, with the idea that you can just want to be a virgin for however long. You're in control of your body, you have the right to decide that sort of thing. If you want to wait till marriage, if you want to wait till you feel exactly right, that's great. It's not a bad thing to be a virgin, of course, but it's also not this paragon of purity and virtue and things like that. It is one life experience 
that you have not had and that you may or may not ever have, for example, sex repulsed asexuals. And the sort of importance that's put on it is always just really harmful, especially to young girls where when I read these sorts of books, of course, that's ages 13 or so is about the lower end of YA, basically. And they're the kids who are usually reading this. It's like 13 to, um, you know, 18 or so is the YA period. And you pick up a lot of really harmful ideas, just even passively. Uh, Fever again. I'm going on a slight off-topic ramble, but not really. Uh, Fever is a series where a girl, it's, it's a strange one. All of the people in the world basically die by the age of 20 or 25. And this has somehow led to this dystopian future where women are often stolen off the streets and then like sold to men to be their multiple wives to conceive children. And one thing in that book is that the main character is in this house with two other girls. Both of the girls have sex with the man that she's been forcibly married to. She never does. In book two, she winds up in this sort of traveling sex circus sort of situation. It's a bit strange. And despite that, she again does not lose her virginity, even though people around her do, because she can hold out until she's with her true love and is able to fulfill it, which is like good for her. But the message again is that she is in some way special or better and thus is given this elevated status for it. And it's the same in this book um, where, I mean, Halo, there's not as much threat necessarily to, you know, it's not like it's a dark, edgy world where Perfected and Fever very much are. But again, Bethany, of course, keeps her virginity and that's a very big point for her. Um, we have, I'm going slightly off because I mentioned a book and then I forgot it. Yeah, we have this book, for example, where there's a lot of threats to the main character's virginity. And in fact, it does get one of her friends killed, which we'll get into. Um, and it becomes very important for her, in fact, to maybe not be a virgin because one of the villains can smell that she's a virgin and that's detrimental. But she, again, is able to keep it entirely until she feels the moment is right, basically. And she, um, spoilers, gets married and then, you know, has a lovely wedding night. And uh, yeah, no, I didn't write any of that stuff down. I'm going off script here because it's just one of those things that is a pet peeve, but it's also something that once you start thinking about it in regards to YA fiction like this, it it becomes really obvious how that sort of thing is. And again, with this book too, I mean, uh, her best friend has a thing, which I'm going to mention again because I'm just getting ahead of myself, but her best friend mourns being a virgin specifically. Her best friend has sex. Other people around her have sex. They're not punished for it necessarily, but her status as someone who hasn't is much better, basically. Anyways, anyways, so the weird emphasis, though, basically on abstaining from sex is so at odds with a book that spends a lot of its pages on makeouts and skin touching and like touching each other horny stuff. It's both looking down on characters for making out, but then not shaming Anna when she does it because other characters are very much shamed. This is a series that has a lot of slut shaming in it, basically. And that duality becomes very apparent when we look at Caden and when Caden reveals some troubling backstory. So when I say Caden reveals some troubling backstory, I'm actually talking about some um, really troubling backstory and that's going to deal with some topics that are uncomfortable and bad and they're unfortunately just going to be very reoccurring in the series. Let me say that if you were somebody who couldn't go through the perfected video, because of some of those trigger warnings. Um, this is probably, again, not going to be a great video because when I first read it, I was just sitting there like, are you kidding? You can't do this in a book like this. And yet here we are. So, so Caden's hot, right? Caden's super hot. Um, he's British also. So he's, that's also, he's just so sexy and hot and he's a band. He's in a band. He's so hot. He has sex all the time. He has uh, powers that make him able to seduce any girl he meets. And he's in this popular rock band too, you know? The book does explain a bit how the, you know, about the bad implications of the Neff having to work. Since he was 13, he's been expected to inspire lust in his peers. One of the Neff says, like one of the other Neff said she wasn't a virgin at 13. 
It's about implied the same thing goes for Caden. Uh, the twin nephs are children of the Duke of Adultery, different from the Duke of Lust. Um, and while they're minors, that means breaking up similar aged couples. I mean, this is a nice save author on like some statutory rape avoidance, but like as they've just turned 18, they're now expected to work with anyone. And the book does know this is really bad. This is obviously the Dukes are villains, so the fact that they are making their children do this sort of thing is bad. Yeah, because yeah, it's it's um it's sex work and forced sex work, basically. It, it's really uncomfortable as an idea and a series subject, and it really feels out of place between like the typical YA hormones and the degree of like lust Caden and Anna have. Like that's one thing, and then when you then look in comparison, like, Caden's entire life has been plagued by hypersexuality and parental abuse. Luckily not with adults, the book does again say that they're- that when they're under 18, they're expected to, um, work with their peers. But that's still not a consensual thing for Kate. I mean, it is because he's embraced it and he's like, oh, this is just my life and I'm happy and I'm cool or whatever. But it's not consensual in that it's the result of, you know, abuse and that sort of thing. It's a really bad situation. And, um... Any, anyways, this is all leading up to something Caden is expected to do as part of his work and has done. So Caden, our main lead, swooned over for being endlessly attractive and wonderful, partakes in international sex trafficking, and um, in does indeed, uh, how do we say, you know, train kidnapped girls on the orders of his father? Like, um, yeah, wh what? What? Like, it it's, this is insane for what it gets. This is a couple paragraphs in the book. It, it really is. It's, it's more in, it, it comes up a bit in the series, but barely in the series. It, it's not a choice of his. You know, we can get into some semantics of that. But it's just this insane thing to bring into your plot and not properly address. And it gets worse. Um, okay, I'm gonna have a quote for this one. I don't have a page number for it. And again, this is on that friggin' subject matter, so I apologize. So, okay. This is Caden speaking. Do you want to know why my father chose to live in Atlanta even though his job was in New York? He's got this infatuation going on with that human woman, Marissa. She's the madam of an underground prostitution ring in Atlanta, international slave, you know, international sex slavery. Young girls from starving families are sold to her, and guess who gets to introduce those girls to their new lives? I held my breath and froze. There was no words to com comfort this kind of pain. My stomach clenched. Marissa calls the girls her nieces. The girl they brought me the night before our trip, our road trip, was the youngest ever. She couldn't have been twelve. Dear God. For the first time ever, I refused him, told him I couldn't, and do you want to know why? I shook my head, riveted by his eyes as the words poured out of him fast and powerful. Because all I could think about was you, Anna, and how good you are, and what you'd think. You put thoughts in my head that a nephew shouldn't have. He paused, staring out the window. My father let it slide for now, but he was furious. He'll be watching me now, testing me. I can't afford to have anything more to do with you. We were quiet a long time. I, I didn't want to leave him yet. Not like this. I had no idea what to say. So, yeah, that's a, that's a quote. Um, which... So, I, I want to also just... One of the lines I did say there that I didn't even write in my note on it, which is... There were no words to comfort this kind of pain, which, okay, Caden is in pain, and we can talk about it, but also, the Anna's narrative focus is not on the situation, it's not on the horror of the situation that he's describing, it's on the pain that Caden feels specifically. So, Caden bravely refuses to rape a 12-year-old, 11-year-old girl. I, I, like, all right. Uh, again, not his fault. It's an evil dad and all, but the phrasing is wild. He doesn't say, the youngest ever girl I was told to do this to. It horrified me so much I had to refuse, even to my horrible dad. It's instead, I know you're a good person and would be sad if I did it. Like, are you kidding me? He met Anna a week ago, and she's the only bar in his mind between... 
I will rape a child and oh no, that's bad. I, I also hope it's clear that this is just wildly dark subject matter for your YA paranormal romance that doesn't get resolved in later books. Well, at least, it, it sort of does. And the fact that, again, this is something that's, I don't know, in the book like twice, it's in the next book a little bit, it's barely in the last book, and it's just kind of resolved in the epilogue. And you're introducing this as a concept. You have Caden as a love interest who, yes, starts out as like a bad boy, but I think this is too bad for a boy to be. <laughs> because the implication very much being, and is in fact true, that he has participated in this not even super against his will. He's never thought anything morally bad about this until he met Anna. And even when he's met Anna, it's not even that the moral issue is the problem. It's not like, oh no, I was raised to think this is totally fine because my dad is a demon and he sucks. But since meeting you, I've thought about morality more and I've realized this is a bad thing to do and it's really bad. It's instead, it's all about just like, you disapprove and thus I have gained feelings. And... Her as the only barrier for him to commit this crime is indeed true because in book two, when they break up a bit, and I will cover this, he goes back to working for his dad, like, full on, not even caring. And it's like, oh, I'm just so depressed now, I can't help but participate in international sex crimes. Like, Caden is way too willing and chill about this, Anna is too chill about this, and nobody cares enough that breaking up this whole ring is not a plot point. It's something that is done in one sentence in the epilogue of the full trilogy. Jesus Christ. I mentioned it briefly, uh, Caden is English, so he uses love a lot. Sometimes the author will remember this almost suddenly and he'll just fall into using a bunch of these really awkward... It's the case of where they'll write out the accent, so they will do L-U-V, like love, and they will do um, arse, and I mean, to be fair, arse is spelled arse, but basically every so often in this American English book, they will switch into these really specific English terms and it always feels very out of place, it's very obnoxious. I'm not English, I do live in England, and whenever they fall into that British dialect, it's just the most clunky and awkward thing. And anyways, let's talk about Caden. So, Caden isn't so bad as a love interest barring the sex crimes, one of those common phrases I seem to say in YA fiction. I've seen a lot worse, yes. He, he doesn't push Anna around physically or yell at her or stalk her, you know, very high bar. He's helpful at first and they have some friend-like chats. Once she falls in love with him, it's just a constant stream of we can't be together, I can never truly love you, and it's just very boring. He's very boring overall, but he's not outright abusive. But the other side of this coin is Copano. And, hmm, okay, I've never seen someone like Copano in YA this sort of YA, the YA from this era, YA of this time. And I've never seen someone like Copano as a love interest, and I do say that lightly though. He's treated as a love interest, but he's introduced late in the book, and he's never once treated equally to Caden. He's obviously the obligatory love triangle leg, and yet the author can't commit to writing him as if there was even a 1% chance that, that he was an endgame ship. This is something I talked about in Halo as well. And I think that there was an issue in general around this time where there was this expectation that you would always have to have a like a love triangle. But a lot of the time the author really couldn't commit to the point of a love triangle is like they're both equally tempting in some way, you know? It's so that you really have to be torn between them. I mean, in a good YA love triangle too, they represent different ideologies in some way. So it might be like one of them, you know, the girl embraces her anger with them or whatever. And one of them, it's like, Maybe she learns patience, I don't know. They usually represent some two different paths for the author to make, and in addition to that, you want to treat them about equal so that there's suspense on who they will choose. And in a lot of books, they never fail that. You can always tell they do fail that. You can always tell who the final end game is. And then there's like kind of Copano, who's a bit like Jake Thorne. Jake Thorne is written all hot and sexy, even though he's always, always bad. Copano has more of a potential chance to be a love interest, but he's not written like one. So here's some things about Copano. He's a super born-again Christian, and he's peaceful, very peaceful, neutral. He doesn't speak much. He just seems very calm. Uh, he's also African. 
Um, which is kind of surprising because there's one other non-white character named Blake, who is, um, I don't think we have his exact ethnicity. I know that he's Asian. And definitely in this, this period of time, a black male love interest, or even just like a black man in general, honestly, is extremely rare. So it was a bit surprising that we have a character from Africa as the love interest. However, it's only going to lead to some insanely bad takes and problematic things. So, Kapano is the son of the Duke of Wrath, and that definitely does bother me. He refuses to work for his father anymore, and, you know, why didn't Caden ever do that? Whatever. But unlike, like, every other Neff, he basically has this inclination towards his dad's sin, which he has to work to resist. And if overcome with, he'll go over the top. And if you can't guess why that is a bit of a problem, I mean, here's why, basically. The large, aggressive black man, like, that's a racial stereotype. And though Copano is nonviolent, he used to be in charge of and caused severe rage. It's this idea that this deep rage is hidden under his surface and that at any point he's, you know, a large, scary-looking guy. He's described as being very, like, tall and such. And yeah, it's basically, it's playing into this really bad stereotype. And I think the author probably had just had no idea that this was a stereotype. But it's not good that our only black character and our black love interest is a man who has to struggle to contain his rage or else he will go loose, like, feral, basically, and, you know, destroy something in anger. Like, great. So that's Copano. Uh, he doesn't get a lot of lines. He doesn't do much. He causes jealousy in Caden, and Anna has a few moments of like, he's so nice, it would be go so good for me. Despite being referred to and treated generally as like the other side of the love interest, even being referred to with a joke about love triangles, Kupano is not given an equal treatment to Caden at all. When Caden first appears, we get this detailed description of him, and many other scenes describe him and his body in a lot of detail. Kupano never gets that treatment. He has, like, one paragraph. He has light eyes, dark skin, and short, dark hair. He smells like caramel. Ugh. So, you know, not nice enough, I guess. But considering how Caden is treated, it never feels like Anna is actually attracted to or interested in Copano. The story says once or twice that she is, to build up to book two, where the triangle becomes a bit clearer. But the writing never reflects it. And, you know, that also, maybe unfairly, maybe not, makes me think of his race again. I've read a lot of paranormal romance, and you usually see this, you know, a bad boy and a good boy. Copano is the good boy. He is stable, strong, he's a good ear, no drama. Usually they're both described and lusted over a lot, but the bad boy will be the hotter one. I've never seen a paranormal book, really, where the other love interest isn't physically described. Especially remember how insanely horny this book is. And I actually suspect that this is because he's black. Like, this is a book of white characters. It's set in Georgia, but everybody's white, and as is paranormal romance at the time. And he's just not given half as much attention. He's never lusted over. He's never portrayed as attractive or described as particularly attractive. And I, I think that it's one of those unconscious sort of things where I don't think the author really was like, well, you know, he doesn't look like your typical love interest sort of thing, so I don't know how to describe him. I can only describe Caden, who looks, you know, the generic white sexy hot boy. And then Copano has nothing, gets nothing, is treated as nothing, and of course is not the true love interest, but will get more offensive <laughs> as the book series goes on. <laughs> So let's get started with the Christian themes in this book. Uh, I don't, as I will say again, especially if you haven't seen my Halo video, which if you enjoy this video, the Halo video is, I was reluctant about doing two Angel series in a row, but I have read most of the Angel series in this genre of YA. That's one of my special interests. So, you know, I, I might as well just carve out that niche and it did win the poll. So I don't have anything against Christian themes in books. I, I really don't. I know I complain a lot about it, but that's because I think that like your spiritual religion stuff can easily overpower logic and good storytelling, especially with how often preaching will actually overtake showing religious themes subtly. Because a lot of the time in books like this, 
it's not even like they have religious themes in it. They just will have, you know, a, a literal deus ex machina show up or something like that. Where instead of telling a good story that has Christian themes in it or is Christian, it will just become a story where, like, they preach a lot and then, like, God will show up and save the day. And I think that's a wasted of potential and I also don't like it. So this book isn't perhaps preaching as directly as uh, Halo say, but there's a lot of clear implied messages. So there's one scene where Anna experiences visions of all sorts of horrible things, including a man who beat up and kill another man. And in this vision, the victim keeps changing. He's black, Jewish, Muslim, gay. I, I don't know. He's wearing a gay shirt. I don't know. And then in this real, like, all lives matter moment, white. So, you know, Anna stands up for equal rights. Uh, similarly, there's the scene where her new friend, um, she makes a friend, talks about how she had an abortion and worries that Anna, as a Christian, would hate her for that. And how when she was getting the abortion, she describes a bunch of protesters like yelled at and harassed her. And, you know, Anna basically says, no, I don't hate you for that. And, you know, is accepting of her and such. So, you know, the book isn't explicitly against uh, socially liberal kind of thoughts, which is nice. Um, I was getting worried when abortion came up, we were going to hit that point. Especially since Anna, very early on, notes she has full memories from being in the womb. Though her friend Veronica isn't shamed for having an abortion, I mean, Anna supports her, it's also clear Veronica didn't want the abortion, as her dad made her do it. She mourns the child, who would have been five months old, and misses her virginity. So without being full anti-abortion, the book pretty much heavily hints at some pro-life themes of that. She's not evil for having an abortion, but mostly because she didn't choose to have it, her mean dad did. So complaining about the Christian themes in an angel demon book is maybe funny, but like, please remember all the insane stuff like I've already covered in this book. There's these strong moral messages that feel so out of whack with, like, heavy makeouts and tit-touching and underage drinking. And Anna is this devout Christian who, you know, will directly quote the Bible and use, you know, fancy, proper, fancy, uh, capitalized pronouns for referring to God, you know, um, as in, like, he, capital. And is able to contend with going to hell because she knows as long as she's good, the last judgment will free her. And I just found that a lot, especially, again, in comparison to how the book will handle subjects like Caden's crimes against humanity and the sheer horniness everywhere else. So sexism. I mean, it's a 2000s paranormal romance, so of course there's sexism. Yeah, of course. I just want to note this book is very much not free of it. Anna, in the first chapter, is looking down on two girls wearing low-cut shirts and having big tits. She, in general, spends a lot of time noting low-cut and exposed outfits. She's very dismissive of party girls and everything about them, really judgmental and occasionally jealous. There's this weird emphasis on, like, sex and gender in general. Girl nephs, for example, are more sensitive than male ones, so Anna can sense people with genetic histories of drink and drug addiction, while the adultery twins can see bonds between people. You know, because they're women, I guess? And women also always die giving birth to Neff children. So it's this real dead mom society. This is because the miracle of birth is so powerful the human body can only deliver a human soul, and the Neff's souls are too strong and kill her instantly. Which, like, the more you think about it makes no sense. I mean... This woman got pregnant in the first place, she grew this baby for nine months, and only on leaving the womb does it kill her. Like, what if you deliver via C-section, and can you have an abortion if there's a Neff soul? Like, is the soul too small when they're first born? We also learned that all the Neff are sterilized from a young age, like 13, I believe. Anna is shocked and hurt by this idea because, of course, like, so many protagonists, especially like Bethany from Halo, her only dream in life was to get married and have a large family. She, of course, wasn't raised by her Duke dad and thus wasn't sterilized. So, you know, cool. But Caden is. There's also only male demons and Dukes. Well, I mean, there is Jezebel who's referred to as female, but also Jezebel is this weird thing where um, she, I believe, is mentioned sort of as having changed her gender. 
So I, I guess she's kind of trans, trans queen Jezebel, which isn't exactly a great representation. But yeah, no, they're, they're all male. And also, despite the fact that angels are confirmed genderless while in heaven, the demon dad is like, we don't have genders in heaven. Cool. Anna always calls and describes all angels as male or him. Despite being genderless, demon dad also tells his story of life in heaven, referring to some angels, you know, with pronouns, generally being male. Even in theory, this was, you know, pre-gender existing, because apparently in heaven and before humans existed, angels didn't have gender. But also, they do have gender in this book because everyone constantly uses gender. Great. Uh, Anna doesn't do Jack, as mentioned in the book. I mean, there's not really a lot of action in this book, but Anna rarely stands up for herself. She never takes the lead or drives the story. Most of the time, it's other people's ideas or invitations that she follows along with or is forced to follow. She has one action bit where she, like, runs for half a page and then she's just caught and that's it. Anna, you know, doesn't really have any personality either. Very common in this kind of book. It's a stretch to say any of the characters do any sort of real personality besides like the broad cartoon-like dukes, but I can't name a single hobby Anna has. I guess she likes Mexican food and I think that's her only personality trait. She doesn't have any ambitions or goals or anything, like no drive in life, just nothing. And She's the chosen one, so that's cool. Angel specific section. I love angels, so let's do an angel specific section. I like to do that when I have angel books. So, um, you know, at, at the very end of the book, in this true, like, Dwayne Sex Machina, angels show up and save Anna at the end of the book um, from being beaten or killed because she protests against the woman being poisoned. She's in this big meeting of the Dukes, she stupidly blurts out no about this girl about to get killed, and she's dragged onto the stage. Suddenly, um, a spotlight comes on, and an army of warrior angels show up. They just kind of stare the demons down and say, Anna does not die now. Like, obviously, Anna is the key to a grand plan, but, like, talk about showing your hand. You've screwed, like, keeping the fact she's a special angel blessing secret when a bunch of angels show up to save her in front of all of the bad guys. In Yeah, like, the angels have armor and they wear long flowing hair and that is, that's the end of the angel review because that's all we get on angels. Book two. We're on book two now. Book two is Sweet Peril. Uh, look, uh, middle book trilogy slump is this thing. It's a big thing, and it was especially defined as a thing thanks to the trilogy era in YA. First seen, like, during the paranormal romance boom. Like, book one, they meet. Book three is some big final battle. Like, what is book two? Well, in book two, Sweet Evil, like, it's sort of like a short story collection with an overlapping cast. There's no plot arc or, you know, anything in this book, which is frankly astonishing. There's at least eight chapters, a large chunk of the book, which are loosely connected time jumps where our main character Anna goes to another country or state for a purpose, achieves it, and leaves. Like, we're operating on levels of sheer non-plot structure that would blow anyone's mind. So the actual plot is that over the course of, I don't know, a year or two years, Anna gets sent on various missions by her demon dad to recruit allies after a ghost nun tells her she's a special prophecy Nephilim. Basically, at some point, no idea, she's going to get tested. There'll be a final battle and the redeemed demons, like her dad, will get to go to heaven and the evil demons will get stuck forever in hell. Demon Dad decides they need other Nephilim allies, so he scouts out good candidates and sends Anna to recruit them to her side. That's it. There's no real meanwhile or subplot, like, that's it. Anna's been working, aka influencing teens to drink or do drugs, and she's very conscious of it and worried for everyone's safety at all times. She tries to keep people safe, but has to be seen as basically going to parties and giving out drugs and such. Demonic spirits basically keep checking in to make sure she's loyal and doing this, otherwise she would stop. Caden has moved to LA and hasn't spoken to her in six months. One day, a ghost nun shows up, the one from book one who died before she met her and left her this angel sword, and tells her the prophecy. She tells her dad, who decides to set up a lot of flights so she can chat with other nephs and recruit them. He also decides she should travel with Copano, 
the obvious not love interest, so that's going on. First, she heads to Syria, this book is from 2013, to recruit Zania. There we go. So this is quite the section in terms of me thinking, oh no, this is going to go bad. And I was right to worry about this. Like, this author and carefully handling any complex issue does not go well. Uh, Zanaya's dad is the Duke of Hate, and he's introduced something, okay, first implied and then confirmed as female genital mutilation to the area. We get it confirmed that Zanaya has had it performed on her. Speaking of, a discussion of hate in the Middle East and a girl whose role in society is to promote hate in the Middle East, Z Zanaya, huh? Zanaya has a scene where she makes eye contact with a man in traditional garb having a serious meeting in a nightclub. He gets pissed at her for being a temptress and chases her out of the building, then tries to attack, maybe rape her, before being stopped by our heroes. Hey, serious subjects exist, yes, but can we agree this book, I mean, look at the cover, look at everything, this book, is maybe not the place for discussions and portrayals of misogyny, female genit genital mutilation, the Middle East, a any of this. Like, Zania hates men and is implied to have been raped more than once and is a serious alcoholic. They recruit her eventually, but she's this bitter, angry mess. After this, uh, each section of recruiting ends with just a section break and a time skip. Anna and Cope get sent to London to recruit the twins. Obviously, they're already on their side, so this is really like a filler fluff bit where Anna and Marna is one of the twins. Chat, gossip, get many petties you know, just a break from Syria. Next up, Australia. Uh, time to recruit Flynn, who is the Duke of Greed's son. He's an MMA fighter who once was made to kill another boy on the orders of the Dukes. Here we have the first time in the book, out, out of two, out of at least two, where the characters spend a very long time not using their super hearing powers because someone is having sex. Also, Anna and Copano make out in a closet. There'll be more on that later. Yeah, th these are we a really weird reoccurring thing that I'll mention a couple times, which is that the series loves to put the characters in a situation where they can hear somebody having sex but don't want to hear them having sex but are forced to because they have super hearing and at least once or twice that person that they're forced to hear is their dad or one of the other dukes okay spring break happens uh, another new chapter section time skip and literally nothing happens anna flies continuously to avoid demon spirits and talks to marna a bit that's it and then we enter summer, as Anna graduates high school and heads to California, where the climax takes place. I mean, climax when quotes. Here, a little past halfway, is the longest section of continuous chapters and time chunks in the book. Anna and Caden reunite and declare their love for each other. Caden and Copano wear Middle Eastern disguises and buy Zania in a slave auction off page. The, the team goes to a private island, but unexpectedly run into four dukes who've brought a bachelorette party out to, you know, bone down with. Flynn is shot and killed, and that is it. I already covered this a bit last book, but we're going to expand on it here uh, when we talk a bit about some iffy race things in this book. Uh, the most outrageous is with Copano. Uh, last book, of course, I was like, oh, he's the sole black character and he's the one whose problem is deep, scary rage, and that's a bad stereotype and also just bad. But this book, it gets worse, somehow, and for no purpose at all to the plot or story, because this doesn't matter at all. So, Copano has a secret, okay? Back in the day, his dad was the Duke of Lust and Wrath, for some reason. And, like, he's the Duke of Wrath now only, but... Genetically, some of his kids can inherit the sin he isn't even in charge of anymore. And Copano has double sins. A deep predilection towards wrath and lust. Yeah, so I already said angry, aggressive black man is a racial stereotype. And you know what else is one? The extremely sexual, can't control self, scary black man. Like, this book wraps both into one. Like, Copano is this quiet, gentle person, but he spends more time, this book, like, seething with and struggling to control his rage. 
In one particularly uncomfortable scene, he and Anna break their sexual tension, um, I mean, the book tells me their sexual tension, and make out in a closet. However, Anna pulls back not long in, and Cope takes a while for that to stop. Like, it's about a page with, like, three protests before he can stop himself. Like, it's this really bad, it's just bad, I mean, it's bad in general, but it's also bad because, again, it's Copano. He is the only black character, one of the only um, maybe two max people of color. And it's just really bad. So, oh, unrelated to the above issue, spe- but talking about Copano, um, Copano spends about a page talking about like his dreams for the future. And he talks a lot about how he wants to help people in his home with AIDS and the AIDS epidemic in general, which again, feels really like the sort of thing that's included because he's black and from Africa, not any sort of character backstory with any sort of thought. This isn't something that really comes back or matters. It's not something that we hear about his life and his childhood and learn this is something personal to him. I swear to God that this is just a case of the author going, oh, he's from Africa, you know, like AIDS, and then just gave him that and just made it all the more worse. Okay, moving on from Copano, there's a couple other points on the subject. Obviously, the Middle Eastern section isn't good. I struggle to say that there isn't any offensive stereotypes, but I mean, there weren't any direct, direct ones, but also definitely. But yeah, there's some there's some really weird, bad stuff going on um, with hijabs and cultural tensions and all of it. Zania, as Zania, uh, there I go again, Zania as part of her hate-inducing work, like, took part in, and this is so weird that we get a lot of detail about this, took part in a sexy photo shoot centered more on, like, showing a little bit of skin while taking off a hijab. Uh, Zanaya, in general, is this horrible mess of everything. When the evening prayer call happens, she bitterly notes in her home that she doesn't pray, but will out in public to blend in. Way later in the book, she gets taken to Cali, where they're like gonna house her in a convent. And she asks Anna how to pray. Like put on like a like a thinking emoji just somewhere. Like I'm, that's a very distinct Christian message for this Middle Eastern woman who's only able to find peace in a church. Like that is just the message. It's just like, oh, she's been like, yes, she's been horribly abused and other things like that. But the point is not really like this is her individual thing. It feels much more like the author is trying to comment on Islam, basically, and saying, like, oh, it's so bad, but luckily she can escape that place, which is so bad and backwards and evil, and then she goes to live in a convent and she learns how to pray for the first time, because I guess it's not that she didn't, she didn't pray, but she knew how that works as a principle, but she asks Anna, basically, in the church, like, I'd like to start praying, and then she becomes later Christian, of course, and, you know, you can say, like, oh, In real life or whatever, this is, who cares? And everybody's different. Everyone's different. That's okay. But in this one here, the message is, again, just explicitly (laughs) how bad Islam is and the Middle East is. And then when she arrives here, Christianity is great and saves her. And that is legitimately her whole story arc. And it's so bad. And, oh, one last thing, in Los Angeles, when we go there, we're also treated to something pretty unexpected, or maybe not that unexpected, some Latino stereotypes. So first, Caden helps win a teddy bear at this carnival game for this real offensive Latina stereotype. You know, like, she's she's wearing, like, short shorts and a black thong, and they talk in this really bad, like, accented... It's where you write out the accent again. They're, they're talking in offensive portrayals of it's so bad and then while well, this is going on this gang of five latino men corner Caden for being with you know his girl and they all drive draw knives and guns and they're all wearing red and i i think it's the blood specifically and i really don't know much about gangs and things like that i'm pretty sure that the bloods on my quick look is a traditionally that's a black gang. I assume that there might be Latino groups in there. But anyways, this just shows up. This just shows up suddenly. And then an angel intervenes when this gang member tries to shoot Caden by making the gun backfire into his face. And so he like dies or definitely severely wounded. The gang members all speak Spanish phrases mixed with English. You know, they they call Caden a gringo. It's so... 
it's so bad. It's just so offensive and bad in every single way. And it's just casually and again, like a best, this is the best selling book series. I'm not even kidding. It, it's, it's so bad. I, I, I remember when I was first reading this, I was, you know, live blogging it to some of my friends, basically. And a lot of the time I just had to be like, Wendy Higgins, no, Wendy, Wendy, you can't do this. Wendy, stop, get out. Wendy, no. <laughs> Caden's not in a lot of this book, which is great. Uh, thoughts of him are always present, though, which is not so great. Anna will not shut up about, like, thinking of, pining, loving, missing Caden. Caden begins by having moved to L.A. to put distance between himself and Anna. And he hasn't spoken to her for six months. At the start of the book, at least. She's still holding this torch, including, like, reading into his band's latest hit single because she thinks he wrote the lyrics and they're about her. And uh, yeah, we do have some band music, which I'm going to read like epic poetry, basically, rather than try to understand the singing, because, oh my god, there is band music in this. I tried to warn you, but girls never listen. Got your innocence insured? Because it's about to be stolen. Right out from under your nose. Prepare to curl your toes. I've got a one-track mind. You've got a nice behind chorus. I had a good thing going, all numb in my shell. Then you took me by surprise, and now I'm all scared as hell. I don't want to feel for you. I don't want to feel. If it means hurting, then I don't want to be real. You crank up my lust, girl. You tame down my rage. You let your inner vixen roam out of her cage. The moment our lips met, I saw it in your eyes. But you were seeing me, too. I now realize. Chorus. What do I want from you? I want everything. And I'm not gonna share. This ain't a casual fling. You can be my bad boy. I'll even be your good boy. How'd the tables get so turned? Fuck it. I'll be your love toy. So those are real lyrics. Uh, the fuck is, of course, censored, but, you know, I feel like you could take it. I. <laughs> so these are extremely bad lyrics. And they're very funny. They also reference a behind, which I'm going to point out because this series is talking about asses a lot. It talks about the main character, Anna's ass, a lot. We we have, he, this is almost like a running joke, I guess, almost, that Caden is a confirmed ass man, and I don't like that I know that. So anyways, Caden shows up, like, a little before halfway to stand outside her house for a minute, before disappearing because some demon spirits show up. And I, I don't know why, because she's in Georgia, he's in LA, what is he doing there? Then ages later, she heads to LA and they deal with their relationship. He has this whole jealousy thing about Copano and the fact they made out. He's extremely insecure and annoying. They kiss or nearly kiss a few times. And then finally they spend two chapters just making out for hours. Literally at one point they make out for at least three hours eight like straight like just kissing and light touching as Anna was worried that if she has sex with him she won't be able to use the angel sword the dead nun left her as that's the only thing that can kill demons though she still hasn't used it yet or anything so they kiss endlessly and they say they love each other. Caden takes about five showers in the middle of this kissing day to cool off AKA, you know, like jacket, cause he's extremely horny at all times. I mean, the section is in fact, of course, extremely horny at all times. Anyways, he continues to suck and be boring and flighting before vowing that he ne like loves her and does more of the fake we can never see each other, you know, as if they've both forgotten he did that like a week ago. I have a couple stray notes on this book before we talk about book three. So there's a character who dies in this book, Flynn. Uh, he's just such a non-character though. Flynn was technically introduced a bit, like at the very last bit of the first book. And here he has two chapters where he just appears. He's in Australia. He doesn't make much of a like splash. Inexplicably, he's in Syria when the boys, Copano and Caden, in fake beards, turbans, and traditional clothes, are buying Zanaya from a slave auction and is noticed spying, and that's what later gets him killed, basically. This is treated like a big deal when really it doesn't matter because he doesn't do anything and hasn't done anything. So while the crew is hanging on this private island, the Dukes come by, as mentioned, to go get laid with this bachelorette party. Cope and Caden listen in on this because they're always overhearing their dads have sex. 
to hide, the crew, you know, all of our gang, perches below the docks of this uh, kind of area in the ocean water for like eight hours. The Dukes have five mile hearing, as the Nefs also have like one or two mile hearing. So they would have hidden on the island, like in the lush, uninhabited woodlands, but the Duke of Lust is there, and he would smell Anna's virginity, as evidently water hides the smell of virginity. Anyways, because Anna, you know, doesn't bone down earlier or at any point, everyone gets hypothermia. They also, by having to hide, can't help Flynn, and I would very much argue this means Anna's smelly virginity got her friend killed. Y yikes, like, <laughs> what, what is this? Anna takes a bunch of self-defense classes and learns to do knife throwing as part of, like, one of the time skips, but it matters in no way to the actual plot. There's no fighting or action going on. At one point, she impresses Caden with it, and that is entirely it, and it will never matter again that she learned perfect knife throwing. Also, at one point, Astaroth... Astaroth. That's a D&D... That's a D and D character that I'm very fond of. At one point, Astaroth, one of the guys, brings a woman out to the docks to have sex with her on the boat, and they also have to listen to that because there's so much unintentional sex listening in this book. Anyways, also, uh, Copano accepts by the end of the book that Caden and Anna are in love, though he obviously still has feelings for Anna. Then Zania, who hates men asks him to help her recover from hypothermia by snuggling up, and I guess that makes them now a thing. Book three, Sweet Reckoning. This book, and the series as a whole, is so absurdly bad it sounds fake. How else can I discuss a book with extreme Christian themes, yet super horniness, where the Bible saves the day, the love and trust is a canonical child rapist, and panty-sniffing, virginity-sensing demon dads are a key plot point. Yeesh, like, okay, so the plot, it's the final battle for good and evil. Well, it will be, I mean, in the last fourth, maybe last fifth. I mean, what, what is this book? Again, it's quite light on being anything. So I barely mentioned this, but Anna starts out the series with two human friends, basically. She has Jay, who is regular human boy, and Veronica, regular human girl. They don't matter very much and they don't come up, but Jay becomes a bit more important, as in this book, Marna and Jay get together, and Marna, who is the adultery twin, immediately becomes pregnant, and that causes some issues. Uh, the Dukes, especially Caden's dad, suspect Anna is the chosen one and are trying to ensure she's not a virgin, since then she wouldn't be pure and can't satisfy the prophecy. They avoid this for ages. They eventually realize that the only way to stop the demon dads from all this thing and is that just basically if Caden and Anna just marry, he can have sex with her without diminishing her purity and they'll buy baths, both the virgin sniff test and the dukes who are trying to like make her lose her virginity so that she will not be pure enough to wield the sword. Yeah, so, so that happens. Um, and Anna and Caden have sex and Anna is very insistent. It has to be penetration for the sex to count, by the way. Cool. Demon dad, um, Belial, who is Anna's father, I realize I didn't introduce half of these names, but it doesn't matter. So Anna's dad is a known traitor at this point to the other dukes, and he's on the run. He comes back during a makeshift Thanksgiving dinner in the body of a famous rapper, who he didn't realize was famous. So he has to go into hiding immediately after, since, you know, people have noticed that this famous rapper's body is missing from the morgue. Uh, Ain like, Anna finally uses the angel sword to kill some spirits, you know, one escapes and tells the dukes that she is the chosen one, and so she has to get fake taken prisoner by Caden for, like, the big finale. She meets with the dukes in Vegas, she thinks about the Bible, watches and doesn't lose her faith as, like, her adopted mom is tortured and murdered in front of her, while heaven ignores her prayers, and then after this chaotic short, pre like, fight, she prays to heaven for the demons to head back to hell or be able to repent. God speaks, some dukes repent or go to hell, and everybody lives except for her adopted mom and Marna during childbirth. And then later she, you know, adopts three kids of Caden. Yeah, um, 30 chapters and nearly 400 pages of just insanity. We're going to have to break it down a lot more. I realize that just sounds like a lot. That's just what the book is like. And, oh yeah, of course, everyone is heterosexually paired off by the end. I have to talk about sex crime so much, and it's quite a lot, really. Okay, so 
let me talk about sex crimes. And by this, I don't mean the wild horniness that continues to be a theme. It's um, the other kind of crime. So this book especially has a lot of uncomfortable sexual assault references. There might have been like a mention or two before. I mean, Caden's dad is the Duke of Lust, and he's of course always horny and has made some mild lewd comments about Anna. You know what he does in this book? He straight up grabs her multiple times, make extreme weird comments, sniffs her hair, some grinding. This is all weirdly after Anna's ma like married to Caden, meaning that is her father-in-law, and it's not like he's trying to assault her to make her not be able to wield the sword. This is just this is just after they have gotten married and she is fake prisoner and it's quite a long scene and quite explicit. Um, he even asks his son, Caden, for a threesome at one point. Yeah, there's also other goons who harass Anna with like pat downs and touching and at the climax, before Caden intervenes, one of the dukes starts getting ready to rape her while everyone watches. I, I, Wendy, Miss, Miss Wendy Higgins, I kicks my thing accidentally again. Wendy, Weggy Higgins, um, come here. Come over here to this, this dark alley I'm in. Yeah, I, I just want to talk, Wendy. No, th there's nothing in my hands, Wendy. Come over. C come here. Come here, Wendy. Let's, let's just chat. Let's just chat, okay? Let's just chat, Wendy Higgins. So, the dreaded, uh, Caden's forced but still, still, like, standing participation in sex trafficking plotline is, a. Uh, addressed at long last, and I mean, I'm mostly kidding by saying that because it's resolved with Caden saying, post his dad being banished to hell forever, he'll call the in the human who runs the sex ring and report her to the law, since now it cannot be traced back to Caden. This makes no sense on a lot of levels. The whole book series is full of nefs talking to each other via text or telephone, with only light levels of secrecy and not getting caught or anything traced back to them. His dad pays attention to what Caden does, but would he really be able or willing to trace an anonymous tip about an international sex line to, like, his son? It, it also confirms, you know, or at least implies that Caden, who was ultimately forced by his dad to participate in sex trafficking, mainly didn't resist on threat of his own life. This series takes place over four years, roughly, and for all of book two, Caden is, um, you know, still just kind of hanging out. Uh, by, by the end, I mean, he hates his dad, he's against his dad, and yet he still doesn't report the sex ring. He's putting his own life, like, solidly for a few years after meeting Anna, turning fully good, gaining morals, ahead of women, all of these women. Like, remember, like, in book one again, he was ordered to train a 13-year-old girl? Um, he doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't care about that, anything. He's not learned morals by hanging out with Anna. He puts all of that stuff aside and reporting this crime, doing anything about this crime, until only after his dad has been banished to hell, because that way he won't be punished if he's caught for that. That is it. It's one of the least moral things. And again, we're looking at a book that is a Christian book that is trying to put some sort of moral forward a lot of the time, especially in this book. In this book, Caden and Anna finally have sex, right? Okay, good. So, you know, they still have to wait until marriage first. I mean, yes. Once they have sex, they cannot stop having sex. Caden's supposed to be hypersexual thanks to his demon ancestry from, like, you know, the guy in charge of lust. But he's obnoxiously down to clown. He's so annoying. I have, um... A bit of a, I don't really want to read the script, but I, I have a quote here, um, which is basically, there's a section where Anna, like, sends him a very mildly sexy picture, and then we get to read a bunch of his responses in text form, which are mostly written in poor, you know, text font. So, like, if it's you, it's your, your, you're so f in hot, f me, like, it's that sort of writing. And, um... I, yeah, so let me just actually just read a bunch of these and imagine it's written in like the worst text speak possible that nobody really uses, okay? Um, I can't believe you took a pic. Killing me. Dying. My worry began to subside and laughter rose up again. Text messages poured in one after another. Cannot stop staring. Just wait, little vixen. F me. You're so effing hot. You're in serious trouble when I see you again. Serious trouble. 
Woo, dang, it was hot under the covers. I kicked them off, feeling relieved, giddy, and so tired. When a minute passed with no messages, I texted him back. And she said, Baby steps for your nerdy girl. She's not a nerd. I smiled at his quick response. Nerdy, my arse. All the cold showers in the world won't cure what you've done to me. Sorry, I texted, still smiling like an idiot. You're not. Leave me alone. I'll be busy for a bit. P.S. I love you. <laughs> okay. So, you know, that that's the sort of content you get. Anna touches Caden's knee, just his knee, over his clothes, etc., during Thanksgiving dinner, and he lets out a wild, loud sexual moan. <laughs> you know, she's, she sends him a picture, you know, he writes all of that stuff. He has to be reminded and threatened more than once that it isn't appropriate to have sex or make out in various places because they might be seen by demon whispers or because their friends are you know, within one mile and we'll hear them having sex. You know, it, because again, we cannot drop that as a theme. This is a book series about people being forced to overhear their friends and family have sex with each other. Uh, the chapter after they get married is pretty much the sex chapter. There's little more like, you know, there's a bit more explicit terms, but it's not very clear. You know, we know what they're doing and it's not subtle, but it's also not Super explicit. They have sex at least four times that night. The next morning, Anna is woken up by a light and she sees an angel that leads her out. And it turns out to be her mom, her angel mom, who she's never spoken to because she's dead in heaven. Which is a bit confusing now that I think about it. Either she's trapped in heaven or she's dead and angels go to heaven when they die. I don't know. Her angel mother, though, greets her the next morning. And her mom says that the angels were watching and celebrating their marriage. And presumably watching them have sex. You know, thanks, Angel Mom. So Angel Mom is a character who doesn't do anything, speak, show up, except for the moment that Anna has sex, and then apparently all of heaven was just watching them bone down and just really cheering them on. <laughs> so that's lovely. Um, also, more than once, Caden's need to bone nearly ruins the day or so causes serious problems. Like, the horniness is off the scale. Also, just randomly, one time, Anna watches him play guitar and is just extremely, extremely turned on by it, and that was really weird. Christian theming, right. So this book was always pretty Christian themed. It is a it's not a Christian book. Halo is the kind of book that feels like it should have been sold as Christian lit and it wasn't sold as Christian lit. This book is not sold as Christian lit as well. They're both YA mainstream paranormal romance. But this one feels a lot less Christian, but it's still very explicitly Christian. And in this book that picks up and by the final battle, things get more intense. Like as mentioned, uh, there is a thing where Zania, oh my gosh, Zania, Zania, uh, where Zania like becomes Christian at this point. She's fully Christian. She like gives prayer, you know, everybody prays together over Thanksgiving. Um, as for they pray, light shines above the table and everyone feels very pleased and happy about it for saying grace. Uh, one of the clearer themes at play, of course, is Anna's virginity. As I say, like her pussy killed a man. Um, R.I.P. Flynn, didn't matter in book two, gets like two mentions in book three. Anna in book two wants to have sex with Caden, but is worried it'll take away her pure of heart nature. You have to be pure of heart like an angel to use the angel sword, and it's the only thing which can kill demons, even though they don't really kill demons in this book. It's never really pointed out pure of heart has no obvious connection to virginity. In fact, it simply implies having goodness in your soul is all that counts. Anna, in fact, has her own moment thinking of all the armors of God, like in her final battle prep. She thinks of truth, faith, prayer, goodness, and how they're the truest weapon she has against evil. Yeah, that all checks out. It also has nothing to do with being a virgin. Still, Anna does get to wait until marriage to have sex, despite it bearing no confirmed matter to her soul or her purity. Again, we, I've sort of rambled about this before, but yeah, it's not that special. Caden isn't rejected for having a lot of sex. I mean, he's sort of born again in that he falls in love with Anna and waits for her to be ready. But his love is so true that, you know, the sex and all the things he's done is just forgiven. He's now basically pure of heart as well. Why is that not the case for Anna? You know, the final fight to... I, again, beforehand, Anna sits in a hotel room and reads the Bible, scanning the index for demons, angels, and swords. 
I'm not sure why she hasn't done this earlier or doesn't just know some of these quotes, but we get a bunch of actual Bible quotes at this point, which inspire her forward, including the whole armor of God thing. So then we get to the actual climax, and I haven't talked about her much, but Anna was raised by her adopted mother, Patty. She was, I think, basically just left at the doorstep, roughly, of Patty. She, that was just her whole life. So Patty is her adopted mother, because her actual mother is an angel in heaven. But Patty is her mother. She was raised by her. They have a great relationship. They're, like, described as, like, being, like, best friends. She's extremely close to her mother, and that's Patty. And Patty shows up in the climax as having been taken hostage by the Dukes. The leader of the Dukes declares he'll test Anna's faith in God, since she can't use the angel sword if she loses faith. He tortures and brutally kills Patty as Anna watches. Anna prays for help but from heaven, but nothing happens. She loses faith a little, but then is headstrong and focuses on how Patty is going to heaven, and thus is fine with sacrificing herself for this. Not long after, there's a bit of a physical fight. I mean, Anna then wields the sword and prays to heaven. There's not much of a fight here, though. This time, she's heard, and she's able to cast the demons down forever in hell, slash the redeemed ones get to go to heaven. The ground opens up in this earthquake, and she actually hears the voice of God speak directly in her head. So, sacrifice is a very Christian theme. I understand why Patty basically dies for seemingly nothing, and then Anna gets her prayers answered. It's supposed to be a test of faith, and, you know, it's a Christian theme. It's like, she suffers and suffers, but you have to keep having faith even when there's these horrible things happening, because in the end, God will get you. But, geez, I mean, it, it was rough. <laughs> it was really rough for suddenly, out of nowhere, to have to watch her mom get brutally killed, and then accept it without any attempt for anyone to save her, to intervene, um, for her to use the demon sword. Their whole plan is this whole fake capture thing and then the final battle. But there's no attempt to intervene to save anybody in this way. It's only a, okay, she's going to get tortured and die suddenly and we just have to all deal with that. We just have to accept that rather than try to change that. And I think that, again, that's the sort of message that kind of comes in with a lot of these Christian things, but it's one of those things that I really dislike on a personal level. I don't agree with that kind of philosophy, so it really bothered me. I mean, this is also the first time Anna calls Patty mom. Like, Patty raised her and has always been like a mother to her, like her mother, yet only in dying did she get to be mom. Uh, talking about the Christian themes, abortion and childbirth do come back. I mentioned in book one, Anna's friend Veronica laments the loss of her virginity and how her dad made her have an abortion. Anna is like, I don't hate you for that, and the anti-abortion protesters who harass Veronica are portrayed negatively. But the phrasing is still a bit biased against Veronica's dad for the abortion happening in the first place. Anyways, um, welcome to the return of that theme. So, Jay, the human friend, um, starts dating Marna. And they have sex at some point over the five days they're together. And Anna is able to tell Marna is pregnant immediately. There's a line of who knows when the soul actually enters the body. And she can just tell someone's pregnant. It's not necessarily that the baby counts as a person yet. But Anna is literally able to see a woman's belly glowing. A woman who only got pregnant five days ago max and doesn't know it yet. Like, that's before pretty much any medical test can confidently tell somebody is pregnant. Like, also, lest we forget, Anna remembers being in the womb. So, like, I feel like the author is trying to tell me life does begin at conception. Marna immediately wants to keep the baby. She has a twin sister, Ginger, who is angry at this because Neff always died during childbirth. We learn that Nefs also can't have abortion safely, as it usually kills them too. Ginger points out that they know far earlier than any Neff ever has, and could take a morning after pill or try an abortion. It's only been, I mean, potentially a couple of days since, she, like, she got pregnant. She's barely pregnant. It, at this point, I mean, it's nothing, really. Like, when you are one to two days pregnant, I mean, an average of three days, if we don't know when officially she got pregnant, an average of three days pregnant is not pregnant, really. But, you know, they don't. As Ginger points out, she says, it's just the zygote. 
which is funny because at this point, at five days pregnant max, it's barely a clump of cells. That pregnancy is like, you know, I, I can't really gesture with my hand how big it is. It's a couple of cells. You can look at these sorts of things. But they're still afraid that the abortion won't work, even though at this point it barely feels like an abortion. I mean, most pregnancies, not most pregnancies, but it isn't that uncommon for like miscarriage and things to happen when it's this early on and you wouldn't even notice that you'd miscarried because it's just a couple of like cells and things like that. But Marna, however, refuses all of this and is just set on her fate, you know, to die in childbirth. Jay is also fastly like in love immediately. They've been together for like five days. My girlfriend, um, sudden love of my life, he broke up with his old girlfriend last week and he's like, I now love you, Marna. I will raise our child. You're going to die in childbirth, and I love you for that. This is great. It's some of the most insane stuff. It's, it's so weird. It's so weird because, again, Marna and Ginger are twins. They're nice people. Ginger's sort of the rough, protective one, while Marna is much more of the sweet one. Um, and Marna gets pregnant, and is immediately like, I want to keep the child. But for her, this isn't a case of, you know, keeping a child. It's her death. She is saying, I would like to trade my life for this child. I am accepting death. All of you guys, my friends, I love you. Uh, I hope that we can go and stop evil forever, you know, in our big quest or whatever. But I will be in uh, nine months, I will be dead, and I am totally fine with that. And I will have no more experience of anything. I mean, I guess I'll be in heaven or whatever, but she just accepts her death. And it's, it's so weird because she's barely pregnant. She's like five days pregnant. And it feels akin to her committing suicide, basically. You're not going to raise that child. You're not going to have a life of Jay. You're not going to do anything because you are going to die. And her accepting it is something that it's only in like the first couple chapters of the book where people are like, this is a big deal. And then they forget about it. And then she's dead in the epilogue. And that's it. And it, it's such a weird anti-abortion, pro-life, something, something Christian. I don't know what's going on here. It's just not right. <laughs> There's kind of one more thing I want to talk about, and that's Veronica, and just sort of Veronica's story. And this is something you can do in a lot of media and books and anything. It's kind of a nice exercise sometimes. And it's to kind of look at one character and just look at their storyline, their storyline alone, and just what that is. You just take out as much of the plot, everything else, and just say, if we follow only them, what is their story? So Veronica is this human side character who becomes Anna's friend in the latter half of book one. And then she isn't in book two particularly much and pretty much gone in book three. Anna like befriends her and it's great. You know, that's her first female friend. Veronica is this party girl, but she's super nice. And you know, they, they get along great. Veronica develops a crush on Jay, Anna's other childhood human friend. Jay for a time likes Marna, when she visits from the UK, but he winds up having a crush on Veronica too, so Jay is torn between the two girls. It's kind of up in the air how that's going to settle, but by the beginning of book two, Veronica and Jay are happily dating. Really, it seems like a great relationship. Like, Marna is still a main character who kind of misses Jay, but it's not really central to the plot. Jay and Veronica are dating, and they're really into each other, and it's just this establishing for all of book two without a hint of conflict. In book three, right away, they mutually break up. Veronica wants to study abroad in Spain, and they decide to not do long distance. Jay is heartbroken, but again, it's mutual. He understands. It's cool. And then Marna returns, and we learn a lot of unresolved stuff has held on. Veronica used to ask him if he missed Marna or would leave her for her, and he admits to Anna he would have. He used to dream frequently of Marna. And he dated Veronica for about two years, all of book two, but the whole time we learn in book three that he had all of these unresolved things. And that's why when Marna returns, she and Jay are instantly in true devoted love. I mean, they have sex, they don't use protection for some reason, and she instantly gets pregnant and thus dies. Veronica, meanwhile, I mean, she was nice. 
she had a short scene in the beginning before she leaves for Spain where she paints Anna's nails and laments over her relationship with Jay. She was always just entirely normal. You know, later she sends a text about loving Spain and then she's gone, like never mentioned again. Veronica is such an interesting character like that. I mean, she's written out of the plot entirely. She starts in the beginning of the series and she's this great, lovely, every YA book has to have like a quirky best friend or some sort of best friend. But Veronica is gone. Like, I assume it's because all of the Neff needed to be in relationships. Zanaya and Copano just get together because they're spares. Ginger and Blake are a thing, but they're a thing for all three books. And then Marna apparently couldn't end up single and there couldn't be just someone new. So she had to get Jay. It was the only option. You know, at the end of the book, we have Marna dying, Jay's still there, he's a single dad, and there's no mention of Veronica. Like, where did she go? Did she keep in touch? I mean, she never learned about the Neff. She never learned about Anna. Like, do they just never speak again? Do they keep up? I mean, was Veronica killed in Spain, never to return? We don't know. <laughs> I didn't originally write a conclusion for my review of this series. It was just so much. It's so, so much. I mean, it's so bad, but also bizarre. It's deeply offensive and indeed like a bestseller. Like it did very well, honestly. Was everyone in 2011 publishing just high or extremely wide? I mean, who let this get published? <laughs> Why? What conclusion can I make of this? I mean, what what is this? I, I don't know. I really don't know, man. Um, I mean, well, there's actually more. There's a fourth book. A novella from Caden's POV of the trilogy. I mean, will that help me find answers? Let's talk a little bit about it. <laughs> so yeah, there is a fourth book. There's The Sweet Temptation, which is again, um, the whole series, but from Caden's POV. But it's also a novella. And that sort of thing was mildly popular, honestly. You see it all the time on like, I think fan fiction sites and all sorts of things like that. It's one of my pet peeves because I think that there's pretty much no scenario where I'm interested in reading the exact same story, but from someone else's POV, especially if it's the love interest who's usually present for like all of the same scenes. So there's a couple rehashes of old scenes that have a couple new insights really. And then there's a couple brand new scenes as well. It's a very unnecessary book that gives a lot of unneeded details and generally makes everything worse. So the main thing is that there are way more explicit sex scenes, way more explicit sex and general references to that. It's still not mentioning certain direct wording, but it's way more explicit. The second thing is that you get more background details on the sex crime ring that just makes Caden look worse. The third thing is that there's way more disturbing scenes such as, um, I can't believe I have to say this, um, 11 year old Caden being put in a situation by her dad, by his dad, I changed his gender, oh, whoa, um, change, like, 11 year old Caden put in a situation by his dad to get him ready to start working by, um, several women being involved at the time to prepare him for that. And that is a scene. That is, again, not super explicit, but dear God, it happens. Oh, another thing. Um, Caden refuses to have sex with a 12-year-old, um, like mentioned in book one. But now we know explicitly, thank you, that his dad just did it instead. Wow. Uh, oh, the third third horrible scene. Caden talks to a girl who thinks she's here to get married. And he lets her know that she's here for sex slavery. But he says he can't do anything about it and then leaves her to her fate. Wonderful. Ultimately, there's not a lot of extra scenes in this book. We get to see Caden have sex at times where it was implied he was off having sex. We get to hear his side of being madly in love with Anna. It's not really different from reading her point of view on that. The extra scenes are mostly background personal ones, which are mostly dealing with the sex ring or being told by his dad to have more sex. Some aspects felt like adjusted re-edits from the original series, like someone pointed out a couple issues. I mean... The epilogue, for example, talks more about how Caden and Anna are actually living and confirms what they're doing now, rather than just like a very short scene about Anna adopting a kid. Anna actually has a job as a care worker and Caden's bandmate overdosed on drugs and died, so the band is broken up. I don't know why we needed to hear that explanation. 
there's more than just the line of Caden saying, I'll break up that sex ring. And there's some more weak justification of why he didn't either. This again feels like the worst and weakest thing, like the whole sex ring and Caden's refusal to close it. Caden doesn't have a good excuse on why he holds on until after his dad is stuck in hell to call the police on Marissa. He says they have some connections to dirty cops, but she is literally international sex trafficking. She doesn't run the whole of the FBI. She's also a human. She knows about demons, but she's a human woman who doesn't have some special way of telling which cog in her very big illegal crime ring might have anonymously tipped off the government. There's so much room for error that her being called in while Caden or his dad are around doesn't really matter. If anything, she or her, his dad would never suspect Caden because he pretends to be such a good worker. So, you know, Caden makes excuses in this, but they're weak and... Thanks to extra details and scenes, we know he's hurt hundreds of girls due to this trade. Is Caden also abused? Yeah, he's in a very abusive situation and, you know, raised and such to be hypersexual and indoctrinated by his horrible dad and all of this. Um, him meeting Anna is how he changes to be more caring and redeemed. You know, fine, but he still doesn't do anything to atone for his past things which would feel also like a very good way to have more of your Christian message in there if he had to, you know, I don't repent in some way rather than just a personal way. What about physical actions to help? Like, whatever happened to the 12-year-old child bride that he didn't help? Who knows? She didn't speak English, and that was three years ago by the time he closes down the ring. I'm sure she's fine. I, I was expecting, as part of the epilogue, honestly, more of a walk back, like... Caden explaining, oh yeah, we tracked down and saved Iva and that little girl and they're fine now, but they're just never mentioned again, any of these women. Caden calls himself a coward at one point for not being willing to risk his life to report the sex trafficking, but really, he is one and that is bad? And why is it in this book so much? Why is it in this series so much? <sighs> of course, you know, at the exact same time, it's very much at contrast with the rest of the book and rest of the series, which is mostly Caden struggling to keep his dick in his pants around Anna, being very horny and having tons of sex, thinking about sex. It's this uncomfortable contrast between like, hey, 15 year old girl, you're not here to be married. You're a sex slave. See ya. And you know, ooh, Anna's so hot. I can't wait to make out with her nonstop and be horny. And I love that. Like, it's so bad. And of course, because he's English and the book doesn't know how to write that. Also, all of him being super horny is like split in with like shite and blimey and the overuse of the word arse, which um, <laughs> I don't know what sort of accent he's supposed to have. I'm not sure if it's ever clearly said, but it's so wild. <laughs> he's saying blimey and, sh <laughs> and shite all the time. It's... <sighs> It's very bad. Conclusion two. So reading book four doesn't actually help wrap this up. I, I think I think Sweet Evil is a crime against humanity in book form. It's such a paradox. It's so hypocritical. It's happy to throw in random atrocities while only condemning some of them, letting our leads be super horny while shaming everybody else. I mean, this isn't a sensical world. God had to come in and directly actually speak to save the day and end the book. It was the only way out, and it still doesn't stop the sex ring. Uh, the sweet evil, honestly, though, is pretty good evidence for God not being real and for God not being good. You know, if you're ever in one of those weird Christian films about God not being dead and you need an argument, just mention sweet evil. Like, no one can refute this point. Sweet evil is proof that we live under an unjust and or unexistent God. I mean, religion is over. I wish God would come into this room and say a few words and instantly stop this video, too.
I have a couple stray thoughts. I like to throw these in here because often I just wind up with a couple stray thoughts. One, I think there's a gay character in this book. I can't really suss it out. There's a guy named Merrick who um, has an entirely new personality in the falling action chapter, like at the very end of the book. He showed up like once or twice and barely done anything. And he says Anna is lucky to have Caden because he's hot. Yeah, Anna thinks too bad he doesn't have a twin brother. He's all mine. Like, was this some weird way of having him be gay? Merrick isn't even a character and I don't really know what that was. Uh, another point, speaking of like Jezebel, 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 Jezebel was this weird oddity as like the only duke who is a woman. They're all called male except her and she's the only one in the body of a woman. This is suddenly explained in this book as being a recent decision. Uh, the leader of the dukes is dismisses of her like brothers and sister and also says, being in the body of a woman has taken your balls. And she's like, this form gives me better clarity than ever before. Like, was this supposed to be trans allegory or trans representation? Or is it, she's one of the ones who gets redeemed at the end. She's like good now. So is it something about like, she's a woman now. And so that makes her more pure. Like, I don't know what's going on with her, but weird. Um, my last point, I think, is that Anna, I mean, Anna at the end of this, she has no personality. She doesn't develop one over the course of the three to four books that we read. She has no interests, dreams, hobbies, or purpose in life besides being in love with Caden and this prophecy thing that's very poorly defined. She has a chat with Caden post-sex about dreams for the future, where she says all she wants is to be a social worker and help kids and also have five or six kids. This is all we're ever given, besides in the first book, where she also said she wanted to marry and have a family. Now, the other Nefts aren't that fleshed out with interest either, but they show a bit more personality besides nice, and it could be argued that they've been raised in, you know, abusive situations and trained only to work, so being nice is more of a trait in that way, because they've been working against a really difficult situation. Anna has been raised as a normal girl and was outside the Neff world until she was 16, yet has no ambitions at all, nothing at all. In the end, she adopts three kids of Caden, so like, I guess her only dream was to become a mom and that's it, you know? She was a mom, she got a social worker, and she has no other existence after the plot of this book and she barely had one during it.